Well, the whole of the redemption story that goes from Genesis to Revelation is a story of the heart of God for the atonement, the atonement of a broken, rebellious, fallen humanity to be brought back into relationship with the Creator God who had given us life. Now the word atonement, strictly speaking, is more than just reconciliation. It has implicit within it the idea that someone pays the penalty for another. The innocent pays for the guilty. That someone takes the punishment that was directed toward another and in so taking the punishment releases the guilty from the punishment they deserve. I like the story of Bruce Olson, sometimes called Brushka. He was a missionary to the Motoloni Bari, Bari people of South America. As a young man, he felt called of the Spirit to go to a foreign country and share the love of Jesus. In fact, so motivated he was that in his teen years and into his college years, he studied Greek and Hebrew to prepare himself for this call that God's Spirit had laid on his heart to go somewhere and share about Jesus' love with those who had never heard. Due to some health concerns and also a mission society's view that he was not adequately ed educated, all the mission societies that he pleaded with to go to some foreign country declined his offer. Undeterred, he decided to go on his own. And again, like I said, he decided that God was leading him to the Multiloni Bari indigenous tribes of Colombia and Venezuela. Now the pe pe peculiar truth about those people is that they were cannibalistic. And anyone who came into their territory was doomed to death. That'd be a daunting idea, wouldn't it? To go there, to share about Jesus' love. Well, here's what happened. He couldn't find anyone to act as his guide to take him to that tribe because they were scared to death of that cannibal philosophy of the people. So he decided to go on his own through the jungles of South America. And he became very violently ill. And collapsed along the trail, too weak to travel any further. Well, the Montalonis had a tradition that if someone was sick, they would not kill them, but that they were obligated as a tribe to nurse them back to health. So they discovered this Bruce Olson along the, tri along the trail, in the jungle, took him into their village, and nursed him back to health. He lived with them for several years, learning their customs and their language. Particularly, he was connected to a young teenager boy named Baba Shora, who took Brushko on as his project to care for him. When Baba Shora went through uh, his ritual from boyhood to manhood in the tribe, he asked Bruce Olson to be with him. Later, when there was a funeral for one in the tribe who had passed away, Baba Shara shared with Bruce Olson, and the rest of the tribe was around to hear it, the ancient prophecy, think of this now, the ancient prophecy in those Multiloni Indians that someday a white person would come with a banana leaf opened up and share the way of truth to them. Brusco asked, would you show me that banana leaf that you're speaking of? And they took him to that plant and they cut it off and as soon as you cut the leaf, it opened like a book. He said to the tribe, I am that white man. And then he took his Bible and he opened it up and he said, this is the banana leaf. Here is the truth. And Baba Sharo, the teenage boy who had now become a young man, gave his life to Jesus. They had a tradition in that Multiloni tribe. They lived in 
trees, little huts built up into the branches of the trees, and they would sing their history as a people. Well, when that time came and they were singing that tradition, Babasharo added at the end of the song the truth of that prophecy fulfilled in Brushko's coming to them and the truth of Jesus, the Son of God, who came to give his life for them and to die on the cross for all their wrongdoing. And the whole tribe came to faith in Jesus Christ. All because one young man felt that the Holy Spirit had called him to share the message of Jesus Christ. Now I start with that story because one individual took great risk at the initiative of God to share Jesus with some people who were lost from God, ignorant, and had never heard. And in some ways, that's a, a mini reenactment of the incarnation of God the Father separated from his lost children who were in rebellion against him, but the Father's heart broke over the rebellion of his children. So as Doug shared with the youth up front already, the Father was willing to offer his Son for the salvation of the world. Now we know from the scriptures in the baptism of Jesus, according to the Gospel of Mark, that when Jesus was baptized, the Father with a thunderous voice from heaven said, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And in the transfiguration, which a few weeks ago we studied, where Jesus was transformed into glory before their eyes, again God spoke about his son and he said this is my son whom I love listen to him so we know that like every parent maybe to the multi infinite max God the Father had deep love and pride for the glory of his son the glory of his son's willingness to obey his father and go on this mission have you seen my boy? The Father God would say, Look at him. That's my son. So deep love of a parent for his son. Then the question does become, why would God the Father offer his son to the world? Because he loves you. We know that the scripture says that God knew you by name when you were in your mother's womb. He knew all of the days of your life before you'd lived one of them. And it says that he had decided before the foundation of the world that he would choose you to be his very own and that he would redeem you in the blood of Christ with grace that is poured out and lavished upon you till you're filled up and you can't hold any more grace because Jesus Christ has given his life for you. Isn't that a beautiful story? So we come back to the prophecy read from Isaiah 53, and we realize the cost to God and to Jesus that that would be the case. That he took on our infirmities. That he took on our sicknesses that He carried our sorrows, that He was crushed for our sins, that God laid on Him the sins and the rebellion and the iniquity of us all. And then we read from Matthew how every character in the story from their own self-oriented perception reacted to Jesus in a way that was good for them but ended up killing Jesus. The chief priests and religious leaders, even before the trial began, had already predetermined this guy's got to die. Judas, trying to take matters in his own hands and push through a zealous rebellion, put Jesus in a position where he thought 
Jesus would use his miracle power to free himself. Instead, he realized that Jesus, the Son of God, was going to surrender to death. And Judas said, I have betrayed him as a blood. Pilate tried to think of any way possible to get Jesus released and Barabbas to be put to death. It says that Barabbas was a notorious criminal. Maybe he was the Justin Bieber of his day, you think? <laughs> Sorry, that was a little joke. But Pilate couldn't figure out a way to persuade the crowd. And so he claims he's innocent, washing his hands of Jesus' blood. But the truth is that this was the worst violation of justice in the history of the planet. That the innocent, the Son of God, would be put to death. It says they took him out and they drove nails through his hands and they hung him on a cross between two thieves a place called Golgotha. His body was ripped to shreds. His body must have been oozing blood as he hung on that cross. And he bore the weight of the world. Have you ever been so sad that your body just moved with sobs so deep you couldn't express it? And the tears just flowed? It says that he carried your sorrow. No wonder. He said to his father in the garden, is there any other way we can do this? But there was no other way except that he would die on the cross. Now here's a confession from me to you. I sometimes take for granted the death of Jesus, the Son of God, as my Savior. I sometimes trivialize the truth of what Jesus has done. It's a weird thing, but in my sinfulness, in the sinfulness of all people, we can be seduced by grace. In Romans chapter 6, it says that we continue in sin, thinking to ourselves, well, the more I sin, the more grace will abound. Right? The grace is big enough. God will forgive me anyway, we rationalize. So we perpetuate our sinful ways, thinking, I can go ask for forgiveness. It's logically true, isn't it? However, think again of the cost of our forgiveness, of our reconciliation, of our at one with our Heavenly Father. We can't take grace for granted. What's the proper response to the salvation of God, for the sacrifice of His own Son, for the death of Jesus, isn't it to turn from our stubborn, willful sinfulness? Isn't it to swear our allegiance all over again? Isn't it to express our love and reaffirm that our faith is in Jesus, but also that we want to serve Him with our lives? The story about a ship at sea. And the storm of the sea was so great that the ship, though large, had those sea waves billowing over the deck. And one of the sailors was trying to take care of a responsibility on the deck, and one of the waves came over the deck and washed him just like that into the seas that were frothing with the white waves and the huge... 20 foot breakers and he bobbed up and down in the ocean. He had actually been injured by the, by the uh, railing on the edge of the deck so that when he was in the water, though he could swim, he was so injured he was having all he could do just to stay above the water. The ship's captain said, 
We can't put a lifeboat down. The seas are so angry that that boat would sink in a minute. So all the sailor friends stood on the deck and watched their buddy bob on the waves, his hands going up. Though they couldn't hear him, he was signaling for help. Until one other sailor said, I'm going to dive in and save him or die trying. And he dove into those stormy seas, and though the waves were the way I described, he struggled against them to try and reach the man, and he reached his buddy, and he began swimming back toward the ocean liner. Almost miraculous, but he made it up against the hull, and so the captain decided that they could risk dropping the boat right against the hull, and both of them were brought up on deck. And both of them were semi-conscious for the intake of water. And the drowning man came to first. He looked around, realized he was not under the water, and said, who saved me? And they pointed to the man whose clothes were dripping wet, who was unconscious still. And the drowning man crawled over to the man who had dove in to rescue him and wrapped his hands around the legs of the man who dove to save him and said, for the rest of my life, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. Thank you. You know, if I minimize my sin, if I think, well, that was a couple thousand years ago, it's no big deal, right? I've heard that all my life. What does it matter? that I have trivialized the cost of the death of Jesus for me. My appropriate response is, without you, Jesus, I am lost. I need your forgiveness. Without you, I have no salvation. Without you, I cannot belong to the Father in heaven. Without you, I do not know eternal love or eternal life. I am your servant. I am your servant. I'll tell you one more story that Henry Nowen shares about a father of a family in Paraguay, a little village. The father was a doctor and he had a special love for the people of that village and he would treat them, and if they didn't have the ability to pay him because they simply didn't have money, he would treat them anyway, and he would show them love and kindness. He truly loved the people as he lived among them. But the leaders of the village, the police and the governing officials, did not like the governor, or did not like the doctor, because they felt like the doctor uh, had political views that would uh, undermine their power and their authority. But the doctor was so popular with the people, they didn't think that they could touch the doctor. So they arrested his son under false pretense. And they put him in jail. And then they started to have fun with him. And they beat him up. And then they put out their cigarettes on him. And they tortured him, the doctor's son. But they tortured him too long, and he died. The village wanted to have a public spectacle, a big demonstration, and take the doctor's son through the streets of the city in some kind of a political protest. But the doctor said, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to have a funeral in the church. And they won't forget how we show our grief. As Nowen tells the story, he says that the doctor, instead of cleaning up his boy and putting him in a beautiful suit, he brought the boy just as he found him in the jail cell, and he dragged the mattress that was bloodied by the boy's wounds, and he lay in state in the church on that prison mattress 
blood stain, scars obvious, wounds, bruises on his body, to be a public spectacle of the injustice that had been perpetrated on him. Now it says, isn't that a picture of the world toward God? The, the injustice, the rebellion, the defiance, the perpetration of our sinfulness as if it has no consequence and we're accountable to no one. And then he says, but is it not also a picture of the love of God who would offer his son even in the face of that level of defiance and would sacrifice him so that rebels could come home, that children could know their Heavenly Father, and that we could believe that our sins are forgiven. That's the cost of our salvation. All I can say is, God, I will be your servant all the days of my life. I will be your servant. 